All right, let's get started with lesson one, atmospheric pressure. This is the first lesson of unit four, states of matter. To begin with, we're going to go back and review some very important principles on the states of matter that we learned at the beginning of the year in our introduction unit, Tools of the Trade. Now, I would really strongly recommend that you get out your study guides on Tools of the Trade, turn to the states of matter section, and follow along with those notes. Make sure they're filled in um, really well because you're going to be required to um, know the, that information for the quiz here on lecture one. Now, to begin with, if you remember that a solid, the solid has particles that are tightly packed together. These solid particles have low kinetic energy, so they don't have a lot of motion. Um, now, they have enough kinetic energy that allows these particles to vibrate in a fixed position, but other than that, there's not much motion. Now, the tightly packed particles as a result because there are strong attractive forces between particles in the solid state. And if you remember, these attractive forces are known as electrostatic forces, and that should be written down in your notes and understood. Electrostatic attractions between particles. All right. Now, as the solid begins to gain more kinetic energy, the particles are going to begin to have more movement and motion. The forces of traction between the particles are going to begin to diminish. They're going to get smaller. This allows the particles now to have more freedom of motion or movement, and as the more and more kinetic energy is added, they will have more and more freedom of movement to the point we get to the liquid state. In the liquid state, the particles are still attracted to each other. There's still electrostatic attractions between particles, but they're weakened enough that it allows the particles to have more fluid motion. They're, they have more freedom to move around. But as these liquid particles gain more energy, there, the forces begin to reduce even more to the point we get to the gas state. And in the gas state, the particles have complete freedom of movement or motion because they have zero electrostatic attraction or forces between them. Now, a, ga a gas that has zero electrostatic forces is known as an ideal gas. And I will expect you to know that term, ideal gas. Again, an ideal gas is a gas that has zero electrostatic attractive forces between the particles. Now you also have this table in your notes that you should review and make sure you know. It just um, basically shows the relationship between the particular properties of liquids, solids, and gases and their macroscopic properties, their shape, and their their volumes. Just become familiar with it for the quiz. All right, pressure. We need to look at pressure. Pressure is an important principle when it comes to gases. So by definition, pressure is a force that acts on a given area. We can draw an equation, pressure, which is uh, symbolized by the letter P, is equal to the force over the area. All right. Now, this equation gives us a very good understanding of the relationship between force and pressure and area and pressure. So, if the area is remaining constant and we increase the force, that should also, therefore, increase the pressure. So, force and pressure have a directly proportional relationship. You increase the force, you increase pressure. However, area is inversely proportional to the pressure. As, as the area gets bigger, the pressure gets smaller. This, this principle can be applied to, say, um, a girl wearing a high heel shoe. If the girl wearing the high heels uh, steps on your toe, you're going to definitely feel the pressure. It's not going to feel good. Why is this the case? Well, all that force from the girl um, standing on your toe, um, all that force is in a very small area in that high heel. 
and so that area being so small is going to increase the pressure um, that you're feeling. However, if the same girl with the same force um, steps on your toe with a, um, say, a tennis shoe, then the force is spread out over a larger area, and so the pressure is not as great, and therefore you don't feel the pain as much. Right? So I think that's a pretty good example of the relationship between pressure and area. All right, let's look at some units of pressure. These units um, I expect you to know, um, and the relationships of how these units are related to each other. First of all, the SI derived unit of pressure is known as the Pascal. Um, the Pascal, by definition, is one newton meter squared. Now, you probably already know this, but force, the units of them in SI units is the newton, um, which gives us a capital letter N for the symbol for newton. All right, and for area, it's in squared meters. So if we apply our force equation, oops, let me erase this. If we apply our equation to force or pressure, where pressure is equal to the force, which is in newton. So say one newton over one squared meter, that's going to give us a pressure units of Pascals. All right? So that's where the Pascal is derived from. However, Pascals are not the only unit that we will use in pressure. We will also use what is known as the atmosphere, which, stand, which is abbreviated ATM. Now, what atmosphere is equal to 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascals, or another useful is one atmosphere is 101.3 kilopascals. So we can use either the pascal or the kilopascal, um, which is related to one atmosphere of pressure. Now, pascals and atmospheres um, are probably used the most, but once in a while we'll use units of millimeters of mercury, which we'll discuss in a minute, and Tor or torso. Torso we probably don't use very much, as much as we do Pascal, atmosphere, mer millimeters of mercury. But once in a while you come across it. All right. So there are 760 millimeters of mercury that's equivalent to one atmosphere. All right. Next very important concept is atmospheric pressure. Um, by definition, we'll define atmospheric pressure as the weight and weight is a force, okay? So weight of a one squared meter column of air that's exerted um, on the Earth's surface gives us the atmospheric pressure. So let's, let's kind of put this into our pressure equation. Pressure, and specifically, actually, let's do atmosphere, let's use like A for atmosphere, and P for pressure. So atmospheric pressure is equal to the weight of the column of air that's exerted on the surface of the earth. So we'll call W weight and then we'll use air. So the weight of the air um, in one squared meter that's exerted on the surface of the earth gives us the atmospheric pressure. Now the atmospheric pressure is going to change um, depending on your location. And that is because the weight of air changes based on your location on Earth. And we'll kind of talk about that in a little bit more. Now, before we go on, I want to talk more about atmospheric pressure. I want to talk about the standard atmospheric pressure and what that is. Basically, the standard atmospheric pressure is the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, at sea level. So, how do we know how much pressure there is at sea level? Well, we need to know the mass of the column of air in one squared meter. And it turns out that that column of air 
in a squared meter has a mass of 1.0 times 10 to the 4 kilograms. So if you take 1.0, the mass, 1.0 times 10 to the 4 kilograms, that's the weight of the column of air in 1 squared meter, and that will equal the atmospheric pressure at sea level. Okay? And it turns out that the atmospheric pressure at sea level is one atmosphere, one ATM. Oops, one ATM. Ah. One ATM, one atmosphere. Okay? Now, how can we measure this? Well, we can measure the atmospheric pressure using a device called a barometer. A barometer is a simple device. It's simply um, made up of a column of mercury, liquid mercury, and the atmospheric pressure or the weight of the atmosphere is um, applied onto that column of mercury. So here's a picture of a barometer, and we showed kind of how it works. So we have mercury in this barometer, and the weight of the air is pushing on that column of mercury right here. Now, depending on how much weight the air has, that force will depend on how much mercury is going to rise. Well, it turns out that when you use a barometer at sea level, the amount of weight of air is going to push on the barometer to raise the mercury to a level or a height of 760 millimeters of mercury, okay? So at, at atmospheric pressure, therefore the barometer states that the, mil, uh, the mercury barometer is going to raise 760 millimeters. And so we can actually then say, as we looked at earlier, in our units of pressure, that one atmosphere which is this, the atmosphere which is the pressure atmospheric pressure at sea level is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury on the barometric scale the barometer all right um, I, I hope you understand that so what we're, we're trying to say here oops going back here to our barometer is that when the force of air one more time when the force of air pushes down on the mercury, it causes the mercury to rise. And at sea level, it's going to cause the mercury to rise 760 millimeters. And that tells us then that any time we're at sea level, the barometer should be at 760 millimeters, which is equal to one atmosphere. Okay. Now, we also mentioned, though, earlier that the atmospheric pressure is going to depend on our position at Earth. And indeed, that's the case. So if our elevation changes, so does the atmospheric pressure. And this concept, I need you to understand quite well. So let's do this in graph form. So on the y-axis, we're going to label at altitude. And on the x-axis, we're going to label atmospheric pressure all right and then if we uh, draw a graph that shows the relationship between altitude and atmospheric pressure we're gonna get a curve that looks very much like this um, actually I can do better when we redraw that Looks more like, there we go, that's better. Looks very much like this, okay? Which shows you that as the altitude drops, or as we drop in altitude, the atmospheric pressure increases. Now, why is this the case? Well, it's simply this. As we decrease in altitude, the um, mass of the air increases. And so we know since the force is increasing, because the mass and force are the same, so as the force is increasing, so does the atmospheric pressure. All right? 
So the higher we go, the less pressure we're going to experience because there's not a lot of air the higher we go in the atmosphere. So we can look at this with Mount Everest. So this is actually a picture of Mount Everest. Mount Everest, which is the tallest point on Earth. It happens to be 8.85 kilometers ab above sea level, or 29,035 feet above sea level. At this elevation, we find that the barometer reads 250 millimeters of mercury. All right? So quite a bit lower than at sea level. Sea level down here. Recall sea level, you would have a barometric pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level, okay? Which is, this is also one atmosphere. One atmosphere, all right? So again, I want you to know this curve, this relationship between atmospheric pressure and altitude. The higher we go, the smaller the pressure because there's a decrease in force, all right? So the last thing we're going to look here is the layers of the atmosphere. I do not expect you to know the layers of the atmosphere other than the stratosphere and the troposphere. The troposphere is the um, part of the atmosphere where you're going to see airplanes, where you're going to see the Earth's surface, um, land, and so forth is in the troposphere. The stratosphere, the next layer up, that's where the ozone layer is. And so part of the stratosphere will have the ozone layer. I want you to know that. We'll talk about the ozone layer a little bit later. later. And this, the formula for ozone is O3. And that's just sitting here in the stratosphere. Okay. Now, the higher we go up, right, the higher we go up in altitude, uh, the pressure, atmospheric pressure, should decrease. Um, why is that? Again, well, because we're going to have fewer molecules the higher we go up. Fewer molecules of gas. And the fewer molecules of gas means that we don't have as much weight. But as we go down in altitude, the pressure increases because we're going to have a larger number of molecules of gas. And the more molecules of gas means there's a higher weight, which means that there is a higher pressure. All right? So I kind of hope that you get the idea of the relationship between atmospheric pressure and altitude. Um, very important for the quiz and for the tests that you'll take for AP and IB. Um, but this is all I wanted to really discuss with you with this lecture video. So this is it for now. Uh, study your notes uh, really well and uh, prepare for a quiz. If you have any questions, come and see me. And that is it for this for now.